Since 2015, Pop Health Podcast has brought to you some of the best minds in healthcare, including leaders from government, not-for-profit, and investor-backed powerhouses, as they share successes, failures, and how our audience can move forward in today's constantly evolving healthcare world. Thank you for joining us for today's episode presented by 24-Hour Home Care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. I'm Gavin Ward, host of Pop Health Podcast. In today's episode, I had the opportunity to sit down with Chris McLaughlin, a leader with the Society for Social Work Leadership in Healthcare, an organization that brings together social work leaders from across the United States, from Maine, where Chris is located, all the way down to Southern California, where I'm located. In today's episode, Chris shares a little bit about his journey into social work, how he became a leader, and ultimately how the Society for Social Work Leadership in Healthcare has played a big role in his life in the last few years, and how it plans to play a big role in his life for the future. We hope you enjoyed today's episode where you learn more about the society and how the upcoming conference can be a great fit for the social workers in your life. Enjoy today's episode. Feel free to check out other episodes of Pop Health Podcast by visiting us at popupodcast.com, checking us out wherever you listen to your podcasts or watching us on YouTube. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the show. Chris, thanks so much for joining the show today. Hi, Gavin. Thank you. Yeah, great to have you on today, Chris. Uh, I was joking with you just a moment ago. Uh, Folks, Chris is from Maine, and uh, I have the May weather here. Chris, I think you were talking about some snow there on the side. Yeah, we have quite a bit of snow. We've been hammered the last couple, two storms with uh, over a foot. Nice, nice. And you have dogs too. How do they do with the snow? We have three dogs who uh, love playing in the snow. One of them we call the snow hippo. She likes to kind of bury herself (laughs) into the snow and just kind of hang out there for as long as she can stand it. That is awesome. Now, uh, I'm in Southern California, um, as some of the folks may recall. So we don't have things like a mud room or anything like that. How do you deal with like the dogs coming in and being all messy? We have a housekeeper. There's no, okay. there's no other way to say it. We have somebody that comes in a couple times a week and helps us out. That is awesome. I have two retrievers and a backyard with uh, grass. used to be grass. That's no longer the case. It's all mud and dirt mud. now because of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, as we like to start our shows, Chris, we like to get to know the guests a little bit uh, better. So uh, we know you're in Maine. Uh, can you give us a fun fact, uh, a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am born and raised here in Maine, have uh, stayed close to home my entire life, Was have been able to attend uh, both my undergraduate and my graduate uh, program in social work here at the University of Maine uh, close by, um, and really have just come to embrace all the four seasons of Maine and, and try to enjoy as much as possible, even though for half of that year, it feels like there's snow uh, and it stays dark for the majority of the time. But it's, uh, it's a beautiful beautiful, beautiful spot. Uh, We love it. We love um, relaxation and leisure is sort of the name of the game for us right now with how wild the world has become. Um, And so my husband and I love uh, to do things like uh, wine taste or beer taste while we're home and and just try to pretend that we are getting out by staying in. Now you say wine taste or beer taste. Do you subscribe or or join like those ship to home things or do you get it at the store and bring it home? Um, We have boxes showing up every single day. And so uh, sometimes there are really um, fun kind of uh, adult beverages in some of those boxes. And other times it's more of the traditional stuff. But no, we belong to an embarrassing number of uh, different monthly subscription kind of clubs to try to try as much different stuff as possible. Uh, my colleagues are going to be uh, tuning into this episode when I mentioned there's some wine and beer tasting conversations going on. Right. Sure. Uh, that is awesome. What's the name of the uh, the wine expert, the sommelier? It's uh, I, I, what, what is the person called who teaches you about all the drinks? Yeah, some, some, yes, some, okay. sommelier. Yes, you think I'd know how to pronounce it, but that. Yeah, I uh, I just learned what that was about a year ago. So, oh, and you're in California. That should be right up your alley there. It, it should be. It should be. Uh, shame on me. Uh, so you've, you're born and raised in Maine, um, lived there most of your life. We know about some of your fun facts, your dogs. Uh, tell us about growing up and when did you start to develop this desire to get into social work? Yeah. So I remember um, early on in in high school being involved in um, various clubs that were that were more service oriented. And I remember um, 
the Amnesty International Club, where we just get together and do letter writing as high school students all over the country. And so was always interested in this idea of justice, even though I might not have had the words back then to really talk about what it was I was interested in. And then I remember in high school, Silence of the Lambs was released. Um, and I saw that movie and I remember Jodie Foster's character and going, that's what I want to do. I, that, that I've got to do that. Um, and quickly realized as I started uh, my undergrad in psychology with every intention of going on to criminal psychology, I quickly realized that is not what I wanted to do and was very fortunate through my undergraduate years to uh, work at a local psychiatric hospital doing um, direct service on a pediatric inpatient unit. Uh, oh, wow. 16 okay. bed unit. Um, and I was 19, 20 years old. And I met um, some clinical social workers who were the therapists, clinicians for that unit. Um, and through that relationship and through some amazing mentorship that I received through them, um, knew that social work was really my calling. And this, this ability to um, sample so much of this field. Uh, and so from um, as soon as I finished my undergrad program, I worked for a little bit and went straight into my MSW and I uh, was able to get that graduate program wrapped up in my mid-20s. Um, and so I've been practicing as a clinical social worker now for the past 20 years um, and have been so really honored to have been able to work with kids and families across so many different treatment settings. I've done um, time in treatment foster care and residential treatment facilities, um, kids in the hospital, of course, uh, home and community agencies. I was a school social worker for several years. Um, and the last mm, probably 15 or so years has been social work leadership, but I've always tried to maintain uh, a foot in that clinical world and stay really rooted to why it was that I entered this field. Um, and I, I have to laugh because it looks nothing like what Jodie Foster did in Silence of the Lambs. And I'm very thankful of that, that it looks nothing like that, um, yeah. but have been really able to, in, in my mind, uh, shape a career that I'm really proud of. Awesome, Chris. And you, you touched on some things here that I, I didn't know about you, like the foster care piece. Um, I have a lot of friends who have big hearts uh, as I'm sure you do, um, in, in dealing with those kids. And they've actually done foster to adopt programs. Yeah. I've had friends who couldn't have kids who've done it. And I have friends who could naturally have children, but also chose to do fostering. And I know that is um, something that's much needed in our society. And one thing about you, Chris, I've gotten to know you a little bit better over this past year is a lot of the work that you do is not easy and stressful, right? And heartbreaking. Yet you always have this positive energy and smile where does if you mind me asking the joy the joy that you have what's the inspiration there yeah oh gavin that's a tough question i you know i think part of it comes with the belief that it truly does get better and that these hard times that we're in whether i am working with a child in the foster care system who is wondering what their next placement like might look like whether i'm working with a child in a in um, a hospital setting or a residential treatment facility, wondering when they're going to go home, or whether we're living in a pandemic, wondering when this stuff is going to transition and move on. I just, I truly believe at my core that it does get better and there are better days ahead. And to really just try to stay focused in that, that if you, if you truly believe that there are better days coming, the tough stuff that we live today doesn't feel as burdensome or overwhelming. Yeah, well said. Uh, there's that cliche, you, you know, time heals all wounds. Um, there's a lot, there's lots of cliches, but there's a reason they're out there. Um, and uh, well, well said. So you talked about 15 years in leadership. And today we're here to talk about the Society for Social Work Leadership in Healthcare. So as you were a young social worker and transitioning from maybe frontline into leadership roles, how did you get plugged into this, what folks call the society? Yeah, uh, you know, I love this group. Um, I uh, So I won't tell tales at a school that other people don't already know because I've shared this with our board. Um, I found the society um, because they were at the time hosting their conference in Portland, Oregon. 
Okay. And I have a very close friend in Portland, Oregon. So I was looking for an op- excuse. an excuse <laughs> to get a some education, some contact hours, some CEUs, visit my friend and have my organization cover those costs. Um, (laughs) And so while my initial intentions maybe were not, um, they were a bit more nefarious. Yeah. The first day I landed in that conference, I knew I had found my people. I knew that uh, this was a group that I had to be more connected with. Um, And before that particular conference was over, I had uh, signed up to be a volunteer for the following year's conference. Um, I had started making connections and keeping sort of that pen pal book, especially with my fellow pediatric social workers who are very prominent across the society. and not long after that, found myself on the board. And not long after that, found myself chairing the uh, conference planning committee, um, yes. which I have done for the last uh, two and a half years. Um, so this is just an incredibly um, knowledgeable and passionate and and dedicated folks, group of folks that while I have a lot of social work colleagues across the country, there's something about this group of social work leaders And we define leaders really quite broadly, Um, but there's something about this particular group of social workers that draws them to this community, this the society, and it's it's sort of Hotel California. Once you check in, you don't ever want to (laughs) leave. Well said, well said. It's funny when you mentioned that the conference was in Portland. For half a second, I'm like, oh, Portland, Maine. Oh, (laughs) we're not quite there yet. (laughs) We're not quite ready to to, uh, to crash the Portland, Maine market, but Portland, Oregon, absolutely. Yeah, no, I got that. Yeah. So anyway, so tell us, tell tell the audience, you know, in general, like a 30,000 foot level, 30 second elevator speech, however you want to say it. What is the Society for Social Work Leadership and Healthcare? Yeah, the society is really dedicated to helping um, folks who define themselves as a leader. Um, and again, that may be because of your title or your position in your organization, or you might be frontline, but really have a passion for leadership, a passion for, um, for service. Um, we really work to create an environment where those folks can come together, can yep. network, can advocacy, can advocate, can um, learn from one another, and to promote these fundamental Uh, pieces about advocacy and health equity and access to services, especially in light of um, some of these issues of race and bias and and, um, hatred. Uh, are the ability for this team to come together and uh, as social workers, as leaders, and as folks working in healthcare, how do we make this field, this world better for our patients, our clients, and our colleagues? Yeah, well said, Chris. And uh, audience, I think all of us, whether we know it or not, have been impacted by social workers, our family, our friends, ourselves, yeah. right? Uh, Chris, you mentioned your experience you know, uh, with pediatrics. I have folks in my network you know, who have benefited uh, from that specific yeah. service, obviously older adults in my network as well. So um, it, it's pretty cool. And having that, that bond that you mentioned that you've developed with these folks over the years is really yeah. neat. So yeah, uh, I, I especially think Gavin in, in light of the pandemic the last couple of years, this this need, especially in this virtual world we've been living in, um, this need to stay connected and this need to improve our practice to get better at what we're doing because the behavioral health needs of this pandemic have been so huge, so significant. Um, so for me, it's it's been a great time, uh, an essential time to have a group of colleagues spread out across the country that I know I can reach out to at any moment in time and get any level of support I need from them. Yeah, well said. And like like Chris said, across the country, I've had the, the privilege of uh, getting to know society a little bit better. And um, and I know like folks from Maine down to California and all throughout the U.S., yeah. You know, uh, there's leaders and I like how you how you mentioned you define leaders. You it's broad and it's someone who defines themselves. I know you guys have like leadership development institutes for young up and coming um, leaders. And then you also yeah. have. 
yeah, and you also have some folks who, what I like to say, have been pillars in the social work community for a while. Um, so it, it really is a great breadth. I've known about you guys since 2012, I think. Uh, shout out to Bill Mejia. Um, yeah. <laughs> Who, uh, that's how I first got plugged into. He's uh, also a social work leader here in Southern California. So if someone's interested in, in uh, becoming a member, you mentioned it's pretty broad definition. Uh, so they would just go to the website, right? And kind of and d- learn there, or is that the best way to go about it? Yeah, there's a place right on the website for folks to uh, join and sign on to be a member here. There's different types of memberships. So we do welcome students who are even new to this field, who are interested in cultivating their leadership abilities. To your point, we offer um, a leadership institute several times over the course of the year. Those are obviously happening virtually, but we are open to doing some in-person if there are organizations wanting to host a leadership intensive where we come in and we offer, um, I'm, I'm part of the faculty of that uh, curriculum, um, and we offer a very uh, robust and fulfilling 12 hours of exploring your leadership journey and cultivating your leadership style and your sense of self. Um, but we welcome folks at every level of their career. So students all the way to retired social workers who want to stay connected to the field. So folks can go to uh, sswlhc.org and you will see um, a place where you can uh, sign up for our listserv and stay connected with what we have going on. Uh, We offer, in addition to an annual conference that we've talked about, the Leadership Institute, um, we also offer webinars throughout the course of the year where folks can um, sign up to take part of a webinar focusing on anything from culturally competent care to burnout prevention and and compassion fatigue to maybe a best practice in working in it with a specific population. Um, And of course, folks can join the society and affiliate with several of our uh, local chapters uh, that exist across the country as well. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Chris. And um, I know I'm actually, uh, uh, I'll, I'll put it out there. I'm a member as well. Uh, I forget if they call it an associate member or an affiliate You're an associate member. member. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So in order to support or benefit from the society, you actually don't have to technically be a social worker. Um, but if you're in a related service or you work hand in hand, there's opportunities there as well. You're an honorary um, social worker, Gavin. That's thank you. I'll, that's what I'll say. For those not watching on YouTube, I'm patting myself on the back. <laughs> I appreciate that, Chris. Um, okay, so let's talk about the conference um, here. Uh, so the conference, tell us about that, the 2022 conference. Sure. So every October, the society lands in uh, a rotating place around the country. Um, and uh, this October, we will be in Nashville. Um, So we'll be in Tennessee. Um, Really excited to uh, both, again, get as many folks who are able back in person. Again, we uh, in 2021 last year were able to do an in-person conference for the first time in two years for obvious reasons. And we were in beautiful Tucson, Arizona last last fall. Um, And we had a a great number of our members uh, converge there with us and and what we heard over and over again was how important it was for folks to be together and to have that sense of um, companionship through these really, really trying times. We are incredibly optimistic that Nashville will bring that same sense to even more of our members who are able to come with us and be together. We uh, will spend four days together and there are activities, uh, different kind of intensives. We offer that leadership uh, intensive every October as well. We have a pediatrics intensive that um, my fellow pediatric social workers come together and spend a day learning and 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 again talking about these more uh, kid and family related issues. And then we have uh, a really robust calendar of general sessions and breakouts and, and keynotes from all over the country as well who are sharing their knowledge and expertise. 
Um, I'm really excited that this year's conference is going to continue some of the themes that we put into place in uh, last year's conference around health equity and access, around um, the social worker's role in uh, combating racism and being anti-racist in our practices and our approaches, and really this idea of resilience and these opportunities that are ahead for us, should we uh, take them to um, usher in this sort of new post-pandemic uh, way of being with one another. Awesome, awesome. So again, that's in October of 2022 in Nashville. And so folks, uh, put that on your calendars. Um, also, um, for those, some of you know me and know my day job, and I work with social workers pretty much every day, and my organization does. So um, also, there's great sponsorship opportunity uh, for this as well. Um, and feel free to reach out to me. Uh, like I said, on the side, I do support the society. Um, selfishly, uh, you know, having Chris on because it's a, a organization that I believe in as well. Um, so, uh, folks, whether you're a social worker or not, there's great ways to get involved. Um, and again, feel free to reach out to me um, if you guys are interested more about that conference. Um, and then, Chris, if folks wants to reach out to the society, again, the website. All that contact information is there as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, and folks can network directly with the, the society. Um, and uh, Gavin, I'm happy to share a contact information with you that you can post with the with this episode to so folks can reach out to me directly if they'd like. I was I'm I'm happy to hear you talk about that sponsorship opportunity. Um, I have found that this is a this is a great um, a great opportunity for folks to get out in front of decision makers and change makers in this field in healthcare um, and share what what vendors have to offer and what vendors want to share. Yeah, um, a little quick story, this wasn't planned. I know it probably sounds like it was planned, but now, since you brought that up, in 2016, I had the opportunity to attend your national conference. Um, it was in the backyard of Southern California, so it was very convenient. And, um, and to be upfront, um, you know, we I actually made, met two folks who we ended up working very closely and contracting together, and so um, things did happen, um, and it's been it's been great, and we're still partners today. So, uh, like crazy. you said, yeah, it's, it was a great opportunity to connect with leaders there. And um, again, folks, uh, feel free to reach out to me and Chris. If fo folks want to kind of follow you, I know. Um, we got to know you a little bit. Are you on LinkedIn or what's the best way for folks to stay? Yeah, LinkedIn is perfect. I, uh, I have a profile on LinkedIn um, and I'm always looking to connect with folks who are interested in talking more about the society, talking more about behavioral health and, and issues pertinent to kids and families, talking about social work, talking about ways that we can partner together to improve the, the, what we're offering to those around us. Awesome. And as we get close to the end of the show, Chris, one thing I, I wanted to touch on is the term case manager and social worker sometimes can be confusing to folks, or maybe they mean the same thing. Are you able to kind of give us a, an overview of, of what case manager is versus social worker? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I see both of them as sort of umbrella terms. Um, and depending on one's perspective, case managers also may look like different um, different things as well. We have behavioral health case managers, we have end of life case management, nursing care management. Um, and so, uh, and then of course, social worker is um, a huge umbrella looking at everyone from a bachelor's degree um, up through their doctoral programs in social work. Um, some social workers are clinical, like myself, where we are trained in, in assessment, evaluation, and treatment of mental health diagnoses or behavioral health diagnoses. Other social workers um, perform tasks of case management where they might um, be connected with a, a certain client or population and help them navigate the systems that they're um, living in, whether that's housing or education, the correctional facility, or just community mental health. Um, I see there is a lot of overlap um, in terms of skills and sort of personality and characteristics that a good social worker and a good case manager would have to have to be successful. Um, I will say at the risk of sounding snobby, Gavin, that there's a lot of movement around the country to really protect that term social worker um, so that it only references folks that have a social work degree or social work education, oh. whereas case manager is a much more global term 
Um, not every case manager is a social worker and not every social worker is a case manager. Yeah. Um, but when we talk about social work, we want to make sure that we're just honoring the education and the commitment to the field that folks who go through that process have made. Awesome, Chris. Well, hey, man, this has been a pretty, pretty big wealth of information in a pretty short time frame. Um, I know, Chris, while you're involved in hospital leadership and you're involved in society, you wear many hats. I know you also do some consulting on key, uh, social work leadership um, and all the hot, hot buttons. So again, I think LinkedIn, you mentioned, is a good way for folks um, Absolutely. to reach out to you, whether yeah. it's society questions, social work questions. Um, you have the big conference coming up again uh, later this year in 2022. So Chris, I just really appreciate you uh, joining us today and talking about the Society for Social Work Leadership and Healthcare. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to be with you and your listeners. Absolutely, Chris. Thanks again. Thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. And if you have and want to check out other episodes, visit us at pophealthpodcast.com, iTunes or Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, and now YouTube as well. Take care.